What are radioisotopes and how are they used for absolute dating? Well, a radioisotope, it is a chemical element that has an unstable nucleus. Essentially, the nucleus, which is made up of protons and neutrons, has a tendency to break apart or decompose. We call this kind of decomposition radioisotope decay, or you may know it as radiometric decay, an older but less accurate term. The discipline known as absolute dating, it uses radioisotope decay to determine the absolute ages of a rock. So here's how it works. Imagine that when this rock formed, it contained 10 atoms of uranium-238. Since uranium-238 is a radioisotope, it eventually breaks apart or decays away to become lead-206, a stable element. And by the way, this is why we call uranium-238 the parent isotope and lead-206 the daughter isotope. If we picked this rock up today and looked inside, we might find five atoms of uranium-238 and five atoms of lead-206. And that means that five of the original uranium atoms decomposed or decayed away into lead. Now, as it turns out, the rate at which uranium-238 decays away into lead-206, it is measurable, but more importantly, it is a constant. So if we started out with 10 atoms of uranium-238, scientists tell us that it would take about 4.5 billion years for half of those 10 atoms to turn into lead-206. So since our rock has five uranium atoms and five lead atoms, most scientists would conclude that it took 4.5 billion years for this to happen. This is called the half-life of uranium-238. And this simply means that this is the time it takes for half of the original atoms to decay and turn into lead atoms. This would be true whether we had 10 atoms, 100 atoms, or 10 million atoms. According to uranium-238's half-life, it will always take 4.5 billion years for half of the atoms, no matter how many there are, to turn into lead-206. Okay, so let's test your comprehension here. How long do you think it would take to turn the remaining five atoms of uranium-238 into lead-206? And yes, I know you can't turn five atoms into 2.5, but please just humor me. If you said 4.5 billion years, well then excellent, great job. Remember, it does not matter how many atoms you start with. It always takes the same amount of time to turn half of those atoms into the daughter product. In this case, it is lead 206. Now, simplistically, this is how scientists apply absolute dating methods. Now, given what you know so far, can you date our rock? If it started out with 10 atoms, and it now has two and a half atoms, and again, yes, humor me. Well, if you said nine billion years, you would be correct, since one half-life, or the time it takes for half of the atoms to decay, equals 4.5 billion years, then two half-lives, or the time it takes three quarters of our original 10 atoms to decay, would be nine billion years. Okay, so now we've covered the basics. Let's have a look at the two most basic ways in which radioisotopes decay. Now the first kind of decay we want to look at is called alpha decay. Alpha decay is when two protons and two neutrons get ejected or break away from the nucleus of our parent isotope. Let's use uranium-238 again to help us. Uranium-238 has 146 neutrons and 92 protons. When you add those numbers together, hey presto, you end up with 238. This is called uranium-238's atomic mass, and that's why we call uranium-238 uranium-238. Now, so, in alpha decay, two of those protons and two of those neutrons break off from the nucleus. These four subatomic particles are called, you guessed it, an alpha particle. Now, when uranium-238 loses two of its protons and two of its neutrons, we can't call it uranium-238 anymore. And that's because it now has 144 neutrons and only 90 protons. And that means it has a total of 234 neutrons and protons. 
This new element is called thorium-234. Thorium-234 is the first step in a long chain of decay products before uranium-238 turns into lead-206. That's right, uranium-238, it does not turn into lead in a single step. It actually takes 14 separate steps. The second most common way in which radioisotopes decay is through something called a beta decay. Let's just use one example where electrons are emitted from the nucleus and let's start with our new parent isotope, thorium-234. As it turns out, electrons not just orbit the nucleus of atoms. Electrons can also be found inside neutrons. Each neutron has one electron. It is this electron that makes a neutron a neutron. Without it, the neutron would be a proton. In a minus beta decay, one of the neutrons in a thorium-234 atom ejects or emits its electron. When this happens, this neutron turns into a proton. Now given this, what do you think happens to the atomic mass number? Does it change? Now if you said no, then great job because in a beta decay, this number stays the same. Remember that the mass number is the total of both protons and neutrons. Now even though one of the neutrons changed into a proton, it did change the total. Since however, the number of protons was increased by one, we can't call this element thorium anymore. When we go to the periodic table and look up the atomic number, which you'll remember from high school is the number of its protons, and so it's not the same thing as the atomic mass number, we find that thorium-234 has changed into protactinium-234. Okay, so let's test your knowledge here. If a rock originally had 100 uranium-238 atoms, but now only has 50, then how much time has elapsed, assuming a half-life of 4.5 billion years? After two alpha decays, how many protons would uranium-238 lose? And how many neutrons? So if we started with a combined total of 238 protons and neutrons, what would this number change to? After two minus beta decays, which just means that they're emitting an electron, would thorium-234 gain or lose protons? And how many would it gain or lose? Okay, so here's the answers. Make sure to pause the video if you don't want to hear them right now. Here they come. If a rock originally had 100 uranium-238 atoms, but now only has 50, then how much time has elapsed, assuming a half-life of 4.5 billion years? Well, the answer is 4.5 billion years. And here's a quickie. After two half-lives, how many of those atoms do you think are left? You said 25, great job. After two alpha decays, how many protons would uranium-238 lose? And how many neutrons? And if we started with a combined total of 238 protons and neutrons, what would this number change to? Well, we would lose four protons and four neutrons after two alpha decays. So if we minus eight from 238, we end up with 230. After two minus beta decays, would thorium-234 gain or lose protons? And how many would it gain or lose? Well, it would gain two protons because two neutrons turn into protons. In summary then, radioisotope decay is when the nucleus of a radioisotope breaks apart and where the parent isotope eventually turns into its daughter isotope. The methodology behind absolute dating then tries to figure out how much of the parent isotope decayed to become the daughter isotope. When the rate of decay is applied to this ratio, then scientists believe that they can calculate the absolute age of a rock and when it formed. Okay, so it's time now for our spotlight on creationism. As it turns out, absolute ages in terms of billions of years for the age of the Earth, it conflicts greatly with a young age creationist worldview. After all, all young age creationists believe that the Earth is no more than about 10,000 years old. So just how accurate is the absolute dating method. Well, according to this paper published just last year in 2023, 
and also presented at the 2023 International Conference on Creationism, there may be reason for caution. These researchers actually mined the geochronological database, which has thousands and thousands and thousands of records. And they wanted to find out how often these radioisotope ages were either concordant, agreeing with themselves, or discordant, not agreeing with themselves. And 40% of the time, they were actually discordant. Now, if you're interested in that research, then look for the next video on my YouTube channel. So that's all from me, Ken Colson here at Creation Geology for Beginners. Look, if you enjoyed this video in any way, then please go ahead and pound that like button, subscribe and ring the bell. You'll find a link in the description if you would like to give. And as always, I appreciate prayer. Thank you and goodbye.